Today's episode is a little bit different than the format you might be used to. Um, I have a guest on, Jen Jensen, who's been on before. Um, but instead of me interviewing her, we're basically, I asked her to come on to hold space for me to um, discuss the idea of waking up to being a part of the oppression in this world. So as a cis white male, I've been uh, benefiting from a lot of systems, a lot of um, structures in this world that maybe I wasn't aware of and participating and almost encouraging some of the sexism, racism, classism, um, transgender rights uh, that I wasn't really aware of. And so upon awakening to that idea, uh, it's pretty fucking hard to realize that you were part of that problem. So today I'm going to awkwardly try to maneuver my way through this conversation with Jen holding space and we're going to see where it goes. So I just want to make sure that I put out there that I, I don't intend to offend anybody by what I might say or not say. Um, maybe some of the ignorance that I work through, um, my heart's in a good place and I'm, I'm trying my hardest. So I appreciate you holding this space for me as Jen has. I'll see you on the other side. But first, a message from our sponsor. Our healing journey can be difficult and might feel lonely at times. That's why I love sound baths. When we can get together in a community, we intrinsically support and feel supported by others. And that combined energy can help us go deeper into our own healing journeys. And all you have to do is just lay there for one hour and listen to beautiful healing sounds. I'm a sound healing practitioner, and I hold sound baths on a regular basis in the greater Seattle area. You can find my next sound baths on my website at adamrealhealing.com. That's Adam, A-D-A-M, real, R-I-E-H-L, healing, H-E-A-L-I-N-G, dot com. Adamrealhealing.com. Your healing is worth your time. And now an uninterrupted podcast with Jen Jensen. All right, welcome back to the show. Uh, today, I'm talking to a lovely human being, a dear friend of mine, uh, Miss Jen Jensen. And so Jen's been on the show before. And today, I'm just going to preface all this by saying this might be an awkward episode for me uh, to, to maneuver through, for Jen to maneuver through. Uh, this is a, a, a interesting opportunity for me, um, which we'll get into as we start going. But typically, I have people on, and they want to. I want them to talk about what they have going on in life and what the awesome stuff that they do, which is Jen has been on doing that. Um, but Jen is in this uh, beautiful path right now. So she's getting her PhD in developmental psychology. I'll let her break down like the bracketing of what that really means. Um, but uh, for me, I asked Jen to be on this time uh, because I have a topic that um, is very alive in me. Um, it's something that I find a, I, I'm re <laughs> see already cumbersome. I find a hard time talking about because I'm just not sure. I want to be respectful. I want to be honoring. I want to be loving. I want to hold space. Um, I want to be understanding uh, for both the people that have been awoken to this idea I'll talk about, to the people that have been oppressed by the idea, the idea that we'll talk about. Um, and by no means am I a person that is uh, an expert on this. Um, I don't have any degrees in what we're going to talk about. I'm a human being that has woken to the fact uh, that I am part of the oppressive problem in this world, if not this nation, if not this state, if not my family. Um, and it's fucking difficult. It's cumbersome. It's awkward. I've went inside with this for a long time in my meditations and, and was afraid to talk about it. I think you were the first person I reached out to and was like, hey, I, I, I just need to talk to somebody about this. And... Uh, so before we get really into the crux of what all of that means, um, Jen, uh, talk to me about, or maybe help the listeners understand what that, the, what you're going to school for and why this subject matter will be very helped by the knowledge base that you're gaining. Uh, okay. Well, first, thank you for having me. Like I'm extremely humbled because I'm not an expert. It doesn't matter how many degrees I have. I'm just a geek at heart. I right. love school. And, you know, I was thinking about the last time I was here and talking about the trauma, which I still call <laughs> it the trauma, because <laughs> some people have the little T and then some people have like the ginormous T trauma. And the reason that 
the underlayment, the bedrock of what encouraged me to go get my doctorate is watching my students have panic, emotional instability, and, and discomfort and discord, and literally being able to watch their nervous system go in and out of fight or flight from an energetic standpoint, and really thinking about emotional stress, the, the layers of emotional stress, mm. and what that does on lifespan development from a psychic standpoint, an emotional standpoint, a mental standpoint, a medical standpoint, because... In my experience, Western medicine doesn't address emotional stress. Right. It's it's here, take this, here, you know, make sure you get this prescription. And it's kind of like throwing the medical band-aids over everything. Kind of invalidates it all, yes. right? And well, to some degree, it, I mean, it does make us feel better, but yeah. it doesn't take care of the stuff. Right. And unless we take care of the stuff, we don't ever really get better. And right. And that's really the basis for what I'm looking at is... How can addressing the bullshit, how can mm-hmm. addressing and helping ourselves ripple out in every which way possible, whether it's energetic healing, whether it's psychic phenomenon, whether it's Western medicine, whether it's physical health, whatever it is. And the topic that you're, you're going to bring up today is like, it, that is emotional stress personified. That's, that's. Gen- genetic that is psychic that is that is lifetime dna that's that's inside of us causing like the nth all degree of emotional trauma right and that's that emotional stress you know there's so much that we've just accepted as normal life and there's so much with normal life if you really look at it it doesn't fucking make sense Right. It doesn't make sense to to work your entire life to barely scrape by. Right. It doesn't make sense to be, be like shown that you should be a part of a family. Right. You need to get into an age and start a family and start this life. But then the life that you choose takes you from your family because everything you have to do is to support that family. Mm-hmm. And every time you go to work, you're making less money because more taxes get taken out or inflation goes up. And so like we're forced into these boxes that nobody can fit in, nor do they want to fit in. Right. Right. Made the the comment earlier, you know, we're trying to fit everybody in this box. Like I just realized I'm a fucking trapezoid. I don't want (laughs) to be in a fucking box. Right. right? I want to have all these different sides. I want to have malleability. Right. And so the, the, the main thing I wanted to talk about today, and again, this is going to be a little awkward is, uh, in a meditation not too long ago, I got just faced with the idea that I am part of the oppressive problem in this world. So whether that's part of the racist oppression, the sexist oppression, the classism oppression, the separatism oppression, right? All this stuff is in, in some way I've, I've been a part of. Now, I'm not going to excuse myself and say, well, at least I haven't gone out and held picket signs or I haven't gone in, you know, into a, 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 a neighborhood of color and yelled the N-word or I have... Okay, no, I'm not a blatant fucking asshole, right? This right. assless dickishness <laughs> kind of lies. In, I can be, right? We, well, but we it, all can yeah, be. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, yeah, he likes to come out sometimes, but not in, not in a racist way. No. Just, he likes to be a dick, right? But the the understanding that, you know, we're, we're a part of the society and in some way we've, we've contributed to this, right? Mm-hmm. And you can say like, no, I'm a spiritual person. I've never participated or I've got past all that stuff and now I'm working towards the light and all this shit, right? Good for you, right? And that's great. But understand that these connotations even lie in the spiritual practice. And the example that I'll use with this is is uh, highlighting separatism. So I can't tell you how many times I've been in a conversation with somebody about astrology, right? And they're like, oh, what are you? I'm like, I'm a Gemini. What are you? Oh, I'm a Cancer. Cool. They're like, oh, you know Virgos? I just can't with Virgos. Mm-hmm. I won't even I won't even talk to a Virgo, right? Because mm-hmm. it's just our energies don't match. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're all talking spiritual. Oh yeah, you know, cancers are just polar opposites for me or whatever. That's fucking separatism. You basically just looked at somebody by their star sign and was like, Nope, can't do you. Sorry. Because mm-hmm. what's been written in these books has told me that our energies don't fuck it. No, get fucked. You're hiding behind What everybody is hiding behind right now, a layer of racism, classism, separatism, sexism, an ism that you're unaware of, but you're now enforcing, you're encouraging, 
right? Right. We might think we're talking like, you know, again, spiritual practices, you know, talk to your kids about that shit. Oh, watch out for Gemini's. They have two, two spirits, right? They're two signs mm. or air signs. What the fuck, man? What's wrong with Gemini's? The Gemini might be like the coolest person you ever met, but just because they have that fucking the pie sign, you can't talk to them. Right. And so like, I, I don't know. I just, it, there's, there's so many layers to this that it's, it's really hard for me to kind of like wrap it all into uh, like a feeling. Uh, but I can say that as I started to understand my part in this, I got really depressed. Okay. And I got really kind of in on myself and, and I felt like, well, fuck, I can't even do this right. Right. Mm. And I've been an alcoholic. I've been uh, an abandoned father. I've been like so many things that I'm not proud of. And I've been working for the past 10 years to right a lot of those wrongs. And, and I feel like I've been going in a good p- direction, you know, unraveling some of the shit that's, that's, that's deep within me as far as like, you know, cultural stuff that I've gone through being raised in the South in a very racially charged mm. area in the eighties and nineties where the Klan would fly our house on a regular basis. Um, luckily I had beautiful parents that didn't, that, that helped explain, you know, racism to their understanding, right? There's still that part that we play in it. Um, but there's so much that's intertwined in all of this that it's so it's so hard to think that even though now I've been doing work and trying to figure this out for myself, this whole layer of being the oppressor is now falling on my lap, and it's like, well, what the fuck do I do with that, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. I didn't notice, I, I didn't knowingly contribute, but as I sit and I think about it, I did, mm-hmm. very much so, right? And so... I think where I'm at now is more people are going to wake up to this idea. I don't think I'm alone in this, right? right. And when you come to the understanding that you play a part of, you know, an active part in a, a societal oppression that you didn't realize, that depression is a real thing. But the other part that really fucking scares me is that so many times white people have just played the victim card, mm-hmm. right? Oh God, look at, Oh, I can't believe I did that wrong. Oh, somebody helped me heal my trauma. Oh, I'm so sad. Oh gosh, I did a bad thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, we're, we're done being victims here. Mm -hmm. Right. How do we just be better? How do we be better? How do we fix a problem? How do we use our voice? How do we use our stature in the community? How do we use whatever the fuck we have to help this instead of like shying away from a conversation, shying away from a sexist joke, shying away from a racist stereotype Mm -hmm. and, and just being like, Oh, well I'll just pretend I didn't hear that. (sighs) Right. Yeah. And so it's just, I don't know. It's, it's really tough because I think the, the, the the initial thing when we talked a couple weeks ago about this, the initial thing I wanted to, you know, I was focusing on at that point was not playing the victim card. Like, what's a call to action? How can I be a part of the solution and not be a part of the problem? But also, I don't, I don't think going around and just pointing fingers at people, like, look, you're doing this wrong. Look, you're doing this wrong. No. You're a part of the problem. You're a part of the no. problem. If you look at me, I'm arbitrarily waving my hands around, right? Yeah. Uh, and because, you know, there's, there's this layer of, like, somebody's operating from a point of, of your perceived ignorance, Right. I perceive what you're doing as ignorant. Right. right? Now, one of the things that I've noticed in life is that when ignorance is met with aggression, it doesn't matter what you're, what you're saying. People defend that ignorance because you've just, you've just aggressed on them. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they'll dig their heels into the most ignorant statement because they're, they're defending their ego. Right. And so it's, how do we, how do we, call people out? How do we hold space for people? How do we redirect? How do we be inquisitive without one being flared in our own way? Because, you know, we want to, I, I would love to be able to hold a conversation in a calm way and not be triggered because right. I'm a really good asshole and I don't want to be it. Right. And I know when I show up as the asshole, that's not going to be received well and nope. it's going to cause more problems than it solves. Yep. So how do I keep myself calm? How do I use my yogic breath? How do I use, which was probably appropriated from somebody else, right? And so all these tools that I'm appropriatingly using, you know, to help me stay calm and, and focused and, you know, so there's like, there's so many layers to this. So before I just keep rambling on, <laughs> um, fuck, Jen, help me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. So, you know, um, I've been taking notes since our first conversation. Okay. 
And so here's what I here's what I'm hearing you ask for. Um, I'm I'm hearing you ask for some understanding on at the very ground level, the very like the bare bones bedrock, how to be a good human being to other human beings without acting out out right. of anger, frustration, aggression. Um, how to hold space with people that have a differing opinion than you, Mm -hmm. how to address other people when they speak about something that is offensive, regardless of where it's coming from. Right. And then what to do about it. Mm. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and and yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll use a quick example of, of how, (laughs) How I've handled people speaking uh, about, uh, like, say, stereotypes, sexist jokes, things like that. Um, so in the for the past, say, for 20 years, I was a restaurant manager, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I worked in restaurants from down in Texas to up here in Washington. And if anybody's worked in hospitality or restaurants... You know, it's not the I, most uh, yeah. it's not the most healthy system to be in, whether for stereotypes, for alcohol, cons- drug consumption, like just body health, all that shit. It's not the most healthy thing. But as I started to just to kind of get an understanding of who I was and what I wanted to stand for, mm-hmm. um, which was very helpful through yoga, body practice, meditation, things like that, early on in my my change in life, um, I. I got very smacked in the face of how, how toxic the restaurant industry is. And, and, and it's so just accepted, right? I mean, that where I worked in the restaurants I worked at, it was very mixed race, mixed genders. Um, you know, at that time, uh, at least out in the open, there weren't a lot of transgender or, um, Maybe just transgender. There was a lot of gay and lesbian uh, folks that worked in, in restaurants. And I'm not saying transgender wasn't there. Just in you know, 20 years, it wasn't that accepted as it is now. So maybe people were hiding it, right? But all different types of men and women, colors, all this stuff. And But always, it doesn't matter who was working, what color, what gender. The racist jokes were flying. The sexist jokes were flying. The innuendos were flying. And it was just accepted. And whether it was accepted to just so somebody didn't uh, make waves and was just like, oh, I can, I can handle that racist stereotype and I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm not going to laugh about it, but I'll just not say anything, right? All of that stuff was very present. And as I started to, to work with that in myself, I tried to combat it. I tried to really curb a lot of that stuff. You know, hey, let's not talk like that. And it got to the point where I just I, I quit my job. Yeah, I got completely out of that industry because I realized that I couldn't impact it in a positive way, being surrounded by what has become culture in that right. in that industry. So I completely left a, a career, a career that I had trajectory in, a career that had stock options in, a career I had insurance, a career mm-hmm. I had growth plans. I probably would still be a restaurant manager right now. Thankfully, I'm not right, but my way of dealing with this was just washing my hands and walking away from a completely fucking industry, complete industry from people that I had worked with for 15 years. Yeah. Just cause I was like, I just don't know what to do. So I'm just going to leave. Right. And I know that's not the answer, you know, but at that point in time it had to be right. And so like I've had to re- come to grips with that because there's a lot of my family and friends that still are in that industry that are still participating. In a lot of that verbiage, a lot of that dialect, a lot of that just cultural norms that, you know, this is all part of that problem. It's mm-hmm. just become so ingrained mm-hmm. that we don't even see it as being a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, this is just Tuesday, mm-hmm. you know, a hundred percent. That's fucking crazy. It is, you know, so let's, let's maybe start with, um, just where, where you feel you, when, when you hear something, see something, witness something that goes against your values, now your values are yours to choose. Mm hmm. And by making these statements, I'm not saying that I have the best values and that everybody should look to me for a moral compass. No fucking way, right? But, and I'm not trying to impose my values and my moral compass on you. This is me talking from a space that I have now been awoken to, right? And you can use the word woke as a trigger word or you can just use it for what it is, is just being awakened to an idea that you didn't know of before. 
So as you start to awaken to these ideas, how do we understand one, how they land with us? And I think, okay, not even start there. Let's start right there. Finding the way that this shit lands with you. Okay. Right. So finding, doing your work, not just taking some, some statement that you've heard and, and, and verbatimly regurgitating that statement, right. Without even understanding what it means, taking the opportunity to say, okay, I've just learned this new statement, right. Uh, let's say, um, uh, or, an, or a new idea, right. So let's say that I've, I've, uh, been a part of, uh, racial profiling, Mm. Right. Without knowing it, I'm a business owner. I um, no, this is a hypothetical situation. I'm not saying me as a person. Right. Let's say I'm a business owner. I'm uh, in a, engaged in a conversation with a client that's right there with me. We're talking, we're talking, we're talking. And all of a sudden, a person of color walks in. And as I'm talking with that person I'm so engaged with, I find myself looking at that person of color walking around the, the store. Right. Now, you're still in a conversation, right? But you can start to look at and say, am I watching this person because there's another person in the store that I just want to make sure they're taken care of? So as soon as I'm done with this client, I can go talk to that person. Or am I watching that person because they're a person of color? And I feel a little bit of anxiety. Oh, man. Oh, I feel anxiety about a person of color being in my store right now. Shit. Mm. Okay. Start asking yourself these questions, being a witness to yourself so you can start to understand where this comes from Mm -hmm. instead of the muscle memory that we've kind of fallen into of, you know, like, I mean, I think about how the long, I mean, we're still fighting this, but for the longest time, women belonged in the kitchen, men belonged in the, in the workplace. Oh yeah. We're still fighting. We're still fighting that. It's becoming more of a norm, right? To where, you know, men are staying home. Women are going to work. Men are raising kids, whatever, whatever genders, right? We're starting to get out of that, but that's still there. Right. right? Right. And so, you know, so I think, you know, finding the way to understand first where your anxieties lie, where your maybe segregation, separatism, where your isms lie. Yeah. So that you can start to understand like how to, how to, how to work with it within yourself okay. first okay. instead of seeing the blaring, you know, smudge on somebody else's face and being like, you've got shit on your face. Yeah. I'm clean. Yeah. But you've got shit all over your face. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> okay. <laughs> it's a lot, man. Okay. I know. I'm sorry. I've just dumped no, a lot of this you know, too. Dump it out. Dump it out. I, um, and you know, I'm, I am not an expert either. Right. Um, what I am an expert about is my own self-awareness and my own value system and how I behave and, and what I have committed myself to and what I have not committed myself to. I am a huge proponent of doing your own research, do your own work, talk to your own people, um, you know, make things uncomfortable, find people that you are really drawn to, but may not be the same as you Hmm. and, and ask, you know, the hard part about what you're talking about is that, you know, these answers don't re don't live in the BIPOC community. This is our work to do. They've had enough. Right. Um, the members of BIPOC, they've, they've done enough. They've experienced enough. It's now our job to repair ourselves. And actually, you know, Monica used to say this in her, in the yoga classes that I used to take from her, heal yourself, heal the world. Mm, Yeah. I've never let go of it. Um, she also used to use the words, um, like cultivate a brave space. Mm. She may have used a a different, you know, vocabulary, but that's what I have pulled, you know, anything that I've ever done with her over the years, it's all about, creating a brave space and healing yourself to heal the world. And there really is a thing to that yeah. regardless of what we're looking at. And, and this is enormous. It's an enormous thing that ha- that is connected on and interdependent on every single level possible. And one of the things I'll send to you is one of my friend, one of, not my friend, he's, he's passed away. He's a seminal theorist from psychology. His name is Brenner, and he okay. has this, um, an ecological systems theory, and it'll just give you some validation. And it's a series of concentric circles okay. of you in the middle, okay. the individual. And each layer is a layer of interdependence and impact of other people, whether it's family, neighbors, work, friends, 
and then it it goes out and out and out and and out until you know societal norms, economic systems, history, and then you have you know multi-dimensional history, multi-dimensional lifetimes, DNA, and the arrows that are inside of this that are that are showing the energy to and from are in both directions, outside in and inside out. Okay. So this is just some validation that. The stress, the tension, the angst, the frustration, the aggression, that's all real yeah. on so many different levels. Yeah. Um, and I will say, if I'm really being as, as, as honest and as true to myself as I know, it starts with the individual. It's your work. Yeah. And... Um, it's whether or not we are really, really addressing things or whether or not we're just saying we're addressing them and kind of falling into two, two camps, either helping or harming. Hmm. And if we're helping ourselves, we're helping others. And if we're harming ourselves, we're harming others. And harm also is in the frame of ignorance, hmm. um, denial, um, blame and shame, uh, hierarchical casting, like, right. you know, creating caste systems, culting, if mm. that's a word, <laughs> you know, um, prophes- uh, proselytizing a prophet. Like mm. I, I, I know all and you must have me. Right. And the simplest piece I've gained is from actually from a class that you and Monica did together on the philosophies of yoga, niyamas and yamas. Oh Yeah. I remember that. And um, my very favorite book, The Four Agreements, which yeah. I've read a million times. Great book. As long as I start, as long as I look at those components and I'm looking at them daily, I have I have a spiritual practice where I do this daily. Yeah. It may not work for everybody else, and that, you know, it's not meant to. But as long as I continually keep my eyes on myself, I can start to pull apart kind of what I've been calling energetic tartar around my body to really see what's mine and what somebody else's. Mm. So in the face of, and if you'd like, I give you, I can give you some real context Please. if you'd like. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm a white Jewish woman. Um, and there was a time in the early nineties where I was working in restaurants Mm-hmm. And a friend of mine went and had lunch at the restaurant we were working in. And it, the, you know, the, the, what's it called? The server, <laughs> the, server. <laughs> the bill. <laughs> ah. <laughs> See, this is my stumbling. Hi, <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the journey. <laughs> um, the bill came and I put down my share and I gave, you know, it was like 1993. So I think I gave like 15%. And this person was like, well, don't Jew me down, Jen. Uh, don't Jew me down. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And I was 21 then. And so what did I do as a 21-year-old empath? I burst into tears at the table. Mm, okay. So as that has evolved, whether it is a, a racial or cultural microaggression or whether it is somebody coming into contact with me and we have opposing value systems, I have a choice. Right. Um, and for me, it's like, it's like that meme where you, you've got like the 80 million different equations around you. There's not just one choice, Yeah. but if I am doing, if I am doing myself service, then I am going to feel and breathe just like you said, I'm going to get clear on how I feel. I'm going to say it in a way that I'm not screaming because nobody can hear me. Mm-hmm. And then I need to make a decision for myself on whether or not this is the person that I can have in my space. Right. And you've known me for a really long time. I'm in Aries with Gemini rising. I, I've got a temper and it <laughs> goes from extreme to extreme. And that's just the reality of it. Yeah. Um, but my temper my anger, my, my fire, I'm not, I'm not rude or unkind. I'm just hold people accountable. Mm. Um, I am, you know, I always talk to the individual. I do have some friends that are venting people where I'm like, I need to get clear, Right. but I'm not going there to say, did you hear what so-and-so did? I'm going there to say, I am a wreck. 
I need to get clear so that I can circle back to this person right. and have a conversation. So there's, there's that piece of like calming down your own nervous system so that you don't say things you don't mean because mm-hmm. you're pissed. Right. Yeah. Um, and that requires space. You know, we, we talked, I think last time, best friend Brene Brown mm-hmm. talks about the, the difference between a response and a reaction is breath. Mm. So if I feel that sense of urgency that when people piss me off, I do, I've got to take a breath. Yeah. Every time I have not done so, it's gotten, it hasn't served me. And sometimes it's gotten me into trouble with myself where I've ended up for me. I'm not the, I'm not aggressive that way. For me, it shows up as I'm taking on somebody else's discomfort and somebody else's anger, and it's not warranted. Right. So I'm I am a a codependent in recovery, <laughs> where and it's a hardcore recovery for the rest of my life. Where if people are aggressive towards me, like my friend when I was 21, he's like, "Don't you?" And I'm gonna be like, "I'm sorry," and then I'm like, "Wait." Right. Yeah. So I end up calming those waters because I just want you to stop talking. But then I get clear on where I'm at and, oh, that was really unkind. And you have an opportunity here to listen and take in on how I'm feeling about it Mm. or you can be right. And if you want to be right, then there's no reason to talk to you. Yeah. And unfortunately, this person wanted to be right. Well, right. don't, you know, and, and does like, you know, well, don't be so insensitive, Jen, or da 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 And even back then. Discrediting your, your emotions. It's like, you know, now it's, it's gaslighting. Now yeah. that, you know, no, 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 no. Yeah. Mm-mm. And then I have to make a choice. So, yes. Does that, does that it, help? It does, yeah. And it's, it's, I think this is a... You know, this is a good example for people that were that we have in our in our circle in some kind of way, whether they're friend, acquaintance, just somebody you work with, something like that. That you know, there's this opportunity for something like this to happen. Somebody says something, you can have your emotional response to it, and maybe you know, to like what you said earlier, maybe it was like, okay, you just said something anti-Semitic, whether you realize it or not. Um, I reacted in the way that I did, let's say like with your example, I, I started like getting upset, hyperventilating, you know, just like, Oh my God, I can't believe you said that. We're not in a place right now where we take time. Like you said, just, I'm going to take a few breaths. Let's, let's revisit this. Mm-hmm. Right. We were so like, this is the conversation now. And if I don't say what I need, what I feel I need to say now, I've lost my chance. And I think we need to get past that because like you said, there's emotions that pop up and sometimes we're not even aware of right. the emotion that's there or what triggered that emotion. Right. We're just all of a sudden it's like, oh shit, like I feel, I feel, I feel a way about this. Yes. I got a feeling about what just said, what was just said. I don't know how I feel. I know it doesn't feel good, but I would like some time to process this and an mm-hmm. opportunity to revisit this. For whatever reason, that sense of urgency is curated. It's yeah. a curated illusion that you have to do this right now. Right. There will never, it's like, it's like aggressive FOMO. If you don't take this opportunity <laughs> right now, you're going to miss your shot. Right. And you're not, you're not going to. Yeah. You know, um, my, my cousin Terry, who I love to pieces, he is a best selling New York times author okay. and has been on Oprah. Actually, Brene Brown has quoted him in, a, in one of her oh. books. And I was like, hey, yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, he is a relationship guy. Okay. That's his jam. He works with couples and he talks about the, t- the things that need to be present in a relationship, especially around rep- reparation. And it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic. It could just be the human relationship of, of how we address each other mm. is compassion, empathy, and accountability. Okay. If those and compassion and empathy are globbed into one thing. Right. So compassion and empathy and accountability. If those things are not present in any interaction, nothing is going to come out to it. And the hard part about the experience that we've had is that we end up feeling like we might have repaired something. Right. And then time goes by and it's not been repaired. Or 
I might feel like it's repaired, but the people that I'm talking to have dredged it up again. And now it's become weird gossipy stuff. And all of those judgments, prejudices, microaggressions, macroaggressions, they've gone nowhere with these other people. They've just changed within me. And that's okay because it's changed within me. Um, If I get too hung up about what other people are doing or what other people are saying or how they're behaving, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm externalizing my experience. Right. Yeah. I've got to keep my eye on myself, which is why the four agreements are so good. If I am impeccable with my word, mm-hmm. if I am doing my best, if I'm not taking things personally, you know, if that is like a, a like longevity equation for me, mm-hmm. because it, it keeps me in the present moment. Inevitably and serendipitously, it, it connects me to the spiritual practices that I need the most, like meditation, breath work, movement, nourishment, you know, and nutrition, energetic and emotional nutrition from the people who know me and, and get me. Right. And I think that we're <clears throat> blessed because I know you and I both have people who are going to tell it like it is. Mm -hmm. They're going to tell us the hard things and we may not want to hear them, but we need to hear them to make it right. Not to be right with our ego, to make it right, to truly amend. Right. Because if I'm going to come and tell the truth to someone, whatever that truth is, and they're not going to believe me, I have no control over that, Hmm. regardless of what it is. Yeah. You know, and, and then I have decisions to make. You know, like my friend at the restaurant, she chose not to believe me. Up until that point, we were pretty close. Right. I trusted her with a lot, and I had to make a decision. Now, my decision was that I needed to put some distance to gain some perspective. Back when I'm 21, it's not like I'm going to say, you know, I think I need some space right. for you. <laughs> yeah. I need to go and revisit my emotional framework so that I can, you know, um, help my nervous system. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> That's not going to happen. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes what ends up happening, it's just, I need some space. Yeah. And I think we all have to remind ourselves that that's a birthright. We get to ask for what we need. Right. Yeah. And, and we are the ones that give it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. It's not even, I'm not asking you for space. I'm claiming this to you. I'm going to take some space for myself so I can get clear. Yeah. Cause my feelings are hurt and I'm angry. You know, I tend to further that. And if I don't take some space, I'm going to say something to you that I don't mean. And it's probably going to be rude. Yeah. That's not my jam. I'm going to back my butt right out so that I can get clear. Um, Doing those things helps me not gossip about anything at all. Whether I'm, you know, not spiritually gossiping about people's astrological signs or sharing vulnerabilities and stories that are not mine to tell. You know, if I don't take care of myself... And I get stuck in that spot and I want to be right. And I'm victimizing myself. Like, look what happened to me. Look what so-and-so did to me. And then automatically my nervous system is like, you need to get ready for war, Jen. Mm. You got to go find your people to get your side. And that's never going to work. Right. It never works. And especially now where we're, we're on karmic high ground. (laughs) (laughs) Karma is paying attention. Yeah. And you know, mother nature is paying attention. And so the more that we address ourselves and find out where our own prejudices, our own feelings, our own limiting belief systems are and how we address those, that's paramount. Right. Yeah. You know, and in all honesty, that's not something I've done by myself. Yeah. I've got an energy healer healer. I see somebody for craniosacral therapy. I have a therapist, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm doing my doctoral work and, and that inevitably is healing me. Yeah. Um, but if I don't have those awarenesses, I'm screwed. I'm going to end up just like the people that I, that hurt me the most. Mm. And that awareness, uh, there's a Charles Eisenstein talks about this. He's a a Charles Eisenstein. If you haven't listened to him, he's an amazing, prolific author, speaker. He's written many books. Uh, one of the more popular ones is called, uh, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Yes. Fantastic book. And he talks about how, you know, you, you, when you are very quiet, you quiet your mind, you quiet your body, you might hear this like disturbing scream coming from inside of you. And that might be one of the first sane things you've ever heard in your life because none of this makes sense. None of this does. Like we've, we've accepted a lot of just idiotic idiocracies mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. throughout life. And so to, to pay attention to that scream and 
I tell you that scream came to me in that meditation when I, when this idea kind of popped in and I kind of, you know, like I've never had a near death experience, but people talk about like life flashes before your eyes, you know? And so when this idea of being part of the oppression kind of popped into my head, uh, so I, I, as a, as a, as a young adult, young child, maybe a teenager, I was not the most upright citizen upstanding. I was kind of nefarious, sold drugs, did shit like that whatever, you know, we all have lives we've, we've grown from. And, uh, but it, this was, it was such like, it was, it just, it played like a movie in, in my head. And I, so I was 18 years old and, uh, I said before I'm a white man and I used to sell, uh, drugs with another white gentleman. We are driving through South Houston two white guys in the front of the car or in the front seats. And then we had our friend in the back seat was the original 50 cent, uh, not the rapper, but we had our own 50 cent in Houston and he called himself 50 Scrant, And he was an African American gentleman about the same age as us, maybe a little bit older. And he was in the back and we were going through South Houston in this neighborhood to go buy drugs. And, um, and we just gotten, we just picked up and we each, we all had shit on us, right? We all had shit on us. It's all weed, you know, nothing like narcotic wise. And we're driving through a neighborhood and all of a sudden the car pulls behind us. It's like, fuck, that's a cop. And 50 in the back says, give me your stuff. I'm going to be the one they're going to look for. Drive slow. I'm going to get out and run. Two white guys and a black guy in a car in South Houston, they're going to pull us over just from suspicion. We all have shit on us. They're coming for me. Give me all your shit. I know how to get out of this. Wow. We're like, uh, what the fuck? And so ignorance went over. We handed 50 all of our shit, and we slowly drove, turned a corner. He got out and bolted, and that cop just took off right after him. Didn't give two fucks about the other two white guys in the car. Chased mm. the black guy. Never caught him thankfully. Right. And, but that was like, Oh my God. Like that was like, just like a spotlight in the racial injustice that I was experiencing as a child that I just accepted. It was like, Oh, that's, you're right. In my head, I was like, you're right. They're coming after you because you're the black guy in this car. Mm-hmm. Two white guys, they're going to chase you. Mm-hmm. And so even though he asked, said, hey, this is the logic, quote unquote, logical thing to do. I could have been like, no, 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 no. We're, this is mine, right? I'm not taking the chance of you getting caught with all of this because what you have might be a misdemeanor. All of this together might be a felony. Right. Right. And it might be a felony just because of his color. Exactly. Right. right. And so like just those ideas of participating so deeply in that shit, right. knowing that people of color were looked at differently than people of, than white people. Right. Right. Um, it's, it just, it's so hard to look at that and to, to be a part of that and to just integrate that as acceptance into life. That when you finally get to the point to where you realize like, that's not right. And how many times have I done that? Maybe not that exact scenario, but similar scenarios. And it's just, and that's where it's hard to not play the victim and get caught in that victim of like, fuck, man, I've done so much shit to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't do anybody any good. It does not. And to your point you made earlier, going and asking your black friend how to be a better white person isn't fucking the way to do it either. No. Right? So finding the way, and it's like, it's listening to ourselves and asking ourselves, does this feel right? Does it feel right that that the people that mo- that mainly uh, take advantage of not take advantage but utilize welfare systems are people of color right and those people of color and anybody that not just people of color but anybody that that takes it that utilizes welfare has to reapply for that every month right saying hey guess what i'm a shitty human being again and i can't pay for my bills i can't support my family and because i'm in welfare and i'm accepting government assist- assistance i can't accept the raise that was just offered to me and the promotion that was just offered because it takes me out of the money that I've, then the minimum I have to make to be in welfare. Right. So now I make too much money, but it's not enough, enough money. money to get me out of welfare and to right. justify what welfare would take, take care of. So now I'm having to turn down job promotions, all these things that would potentially make, you know, give me a better chance in life because I'm tied to this system that's mm-hmm. going to keep me basically under its thumb 
even though, and then make me feel like an asshole every time I have to apply for it because I have to re- reaffirm that I'm a shitty human being in your eyes and I can't fucking take care of my family. Right. And so it's like there's this just layer and layer of oppression that's been happening for sexes, for genders, for races, for all this stuff that has just become common knowledge and commonly kind of accepted so much so that when you try to challenge it, you get canceled. Yes. Anti woke. Ah, oh, you're fucking woke. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, is there something wrong, wrong with being awoken, awakened to the fact that shit's fucked up? Like, you can put your connotation on the word woke all you want, right? But it just means being awake. Like, I know there's an obvious reason and a term for the word woke in, in, in the communities, and it's being aware of the racial injustices that are happening around you, right? And that's, that's where it's so sticky is because this is not new. This is yeah. 200 years old. Mm-hmm. This has been happening since, you know, 1776. Right. Nothing has changed. Um, it's just ancestry over ancestry, generations over generations. And for the majority, well, no, I don't want to speak gen- in generalizations, my observation is that there are way more communities of people with privilege aware and doing things than there were before, but it's not enough. Right. Right. You know, um, me and the white supremacist, Layla Saad's book, which is an amazing, it's a difficult book, but it's an amazing read talks about being a co-conspirator. It's, it's more than it's, it's partially about, acknowledging your internal prejudices and doing something about them. But then it's also how, how will you show up for other people of other ethnicities who don't have the same civil rights as you do in the systems where there are power. Right. You know, um, and me personally, I go out of my way to look for those places and spaces it's not something that I naturally have access to. Mm -hmm. Like I'm a public educator. I'm in the public school system. It, when, and if I have opportunity to make those stands and align, I will, I do, but they're, they're, they're not as common in, in my place of, of work and my profession. Right. Um, you know what I mean? I do. Yeah. Um, I will say that, um, I continually go back and just going back to the internal recognition of where we are, yeah. of how we are, of what we do. You know, I try and put my money where my mouth is. I donate a portion of my paycheck to the protectors of the Salish Sea that I just started to do cool. as instead of doing like donation based classes for local charities um, in my yoga and energy business. Um, I'm doing that as a portion of my entire paycheck. Yeah. I um, am working with local tribes where my school sits and I'm donating a portion of my paycheck to them Hmm. because I'm occupying their land. Um, I am working in those spaces, trying to be brave and trying to work in that co-conspirator role. But I'm also acutely aware as a white Jewish woman that I have a privilege and I have fear of stepping up and aligning myself where I might get arrested. Mm -hmm. You know, just how loud can I be to where I can be of service? So that there, you know, I have my own work to do. It's there. Um, Mm. I did, however, (laughs) create an acronym because I'm a geek on, on going through that process and it's, and it's to the word rise and I'll send it to you. Cool. And the R is recognizing what's mine and what's not. Okay. Um, and that, that prevents me from being a victim. It also prevents me from being an oppressor. Mm. Okay. Um, I is internalized where you are the problem and the solution. You, you got to get real with it. Right. Uh, the S is speak from compassion and openness. And E is an emerge with a form of synergy. Either we can agree to disagree, but still have care and Mm. compassion for each other as human beings where we're not blaming and shaming, or we truly have a place of synergy where I can say, Oh, I see your part. I see where you're coming from. I, I don't experience that. And I, and I, and I can't say like, Oh, I know where you're coming from, but I can understand it. I think, and that's, 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 I think the hard part right now that I've had. So with the, the, the white people I've had a conversation with, like this conversation with that. I think that's the hard part, right? Because 
let's say, um, uh, you know, was it 2017, 18, when the Black Lives Matter movement started to gain traction and starting to become, you know, uh, more spoken about and, or was it more like 2019, 2020, somewhere in there? I don't, I'm not sure. I think they've been around for a long time. It's been a while. Yeah. But that, that big, like, Um, I think that, um, at least in, in my little community, what really shook everybody was George Floyd. Okay. Right. And I think that that's at least a black lives matter movement in my city, in my community. That's when things just went full throttle. Right. Like we've got to make a change. Okay. So, I'll, I'll speak to that for myself. And, um, I, I will honestly say that I was ignorantly triggered by the black lives matter movement. Okay. Um, and this was one of those opportunities, like you said, this is where I heard something that triggered me by no means did I go on the offensive and be like, Oh, get fucked. Here's my picket sign. Here's my Facebook post. Here's my blah, blah, blah. It was one of those that was like, "How oh, man, you feel a way about this, Adam. Like what, what, where is this feeling coming from? This, this nuh uh feeling. Right. And it wasn't like, like I didn't say, like, I wasn't thinking that black lives didn't matter. You know, it was the, everybody's life matters. Right. Mm. But Again, this was this was my initial response, my my initial tr- trigger, and I was able to sit with this and kind of figure out where it kind of came from for me, and it came from the idea that like I didn't realize I was benefiting from all of these systems by being mm. a cis white male. I grew up in my in my mom and my dad um, in our house in Texas. A lot of times we didn't have power, right? Sometimes we didn't have water, right? I wasn't living a laugh of life of luxury, right? My dad was a truck driver. He was gone for months at a time, home for a weekend, barely saw him, right? Mom worked her ass off. It was great, right? I have two loving brothers, but shit was hard for us, mm-hmm. right? We lived in a very kind of like middle, lower middle class area. Uh, by no means were we, you know, like poor, right? Mm-hmm. We just didn't have all the things, you know, scattered lights here and there, like I said. So, you know, when I first heard that, it's like, no, no, no. I've had it hard too. the life that I'm currently living, right. right? Not knowing that what the movement really meant was the expansiveness of how long this has gone on and the oppression that's been, the systemic oppression that's been in there. So I think, you know, there's, there's an ignorance in the way that this information is being presented, not by the people that are presenting it. And this is a media thing, right? When things get presented, if you're on a side, you're going to watch one of those sides, news networks, whether it's CNN or Fox, right? Mm -hmm. And depending on who's for or who's against this kind of thing they're talking about, they're going to put their own spin on it. And so there's this way that the information is being presented that I think is very triggering to somebody because there's a lot of white people out there that are very hard on life, right? That are on welfare, that are on some of these government services that might not have steady jobs, that might be addicted to some alcohol or drug, Mm -hmm. right? That are living like a hard life that are like, no, my life sucks fucking too, right? Right. Not realizing the breadth of what this is meaning, right? right? And so I think there's 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 that there's an ability to keep that in mind as these conversations are being had, because I don't think that the person that might be anti woke or anti black lives matter is really anti woke or anti black lives matter. They're anti the way it was presented to them. Mm. Right. Maybe there might be a level of that because that's, I mean, that's happened to me. Right. And that's happened to some of the people I've spoken to as we start to talk about more about this. Let's take genders, for example, I had a conversation with my mom before she passed away and, uh, and she was 70 years old and my mom, I, she is one of the most respectful human beings in the world. I, she's raised most of our community back in Texas. She was part of the YMCA, any color, any gender doesn't fucking matter. Miss Faye will be your fucking homie. Right. And so we were having a conversation one night and she was, you know, uh, pronouns came up, you know, he, she, them, they, you know, and this is. Uh, you know, a hot button issue for elderly, you know? And so my mom was getting frustrated. Fucking, I don't know what's going on with the pronouns and are they them? Are they a they? Is that a she? Looks like a she might be a he, all this stuff. And I'm like, 
Okay, and I'm just holding space, right? I'm holding space for my mom because I know down deep, I know my mom is a loving human being. And I can tell from the verbiage she's using, she's confused. Right. Right. Not confused as dementia confused, but confused as like, how do I fucking approach this but still be respectful? Because I don't want to fucking offend anybody. Right. And that's what we finally got to. I'm like, okay, so let me reframe what you've just said. You want to make sure that the person you're talking to, no matter what color they are, what gender they recognize as, they feel heard, they feel respected, they feel loved. Yes. Awesome. That's that vulnerable, honest place where I think we need to approach this from. You know, it's kind of like going to a foreign country and knowing a little bit of, of, of that language, mm-hmm. right? So let's say I go to Mexico, I know a little bit of Spanish, I go and cumbersomely say to a local, say, Donde está el baño? And that person, and I've had this happen before, mm-hmm. that person looks at me with, with like this childlike reverence of like, oh man. You almost got it. But you know what? I get what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. Follow me. right? Yeah. Come with me. I will show you. I'm going to walk you to this fucking bathroom. Yeah. But if I walk to that human being and says, hey, where is your bathroom? Mm-hmm. Right? Speaking slow and loud like ignorant Americans do when they're in a foreign country because they think that's how they'll be understood. I've had that happen. And that person will walk away and be like, get fucked. You're yeah. an asshole. Yeah. Right. So it's how we approach the situation of our own ignorance, of our own awkwardness, of our own cumbersomeness, being vulnerable, showing that because mm-hmm. that there's no need to re- lead with the ego with shit like this. But we do. That's what's gotten us in yeah, trouble in the first place. Do. Right. Yeah. Do. So um, I have I have some information because I've been looking things up. Awesome. So the Black Lives Matters movement started in 2013 13, okay. um, by um, three female black organizers and the Black Lives Matter movement began with the social media hashtag after the acquittal of George Zimmerman after uh, Zimmerman after the death of Trayvon Martin. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and you know, I think it's really hard, especially for for myself as a woman of privilege, to understand the violence and the anger of some of the things that I've seen in the Black Lives Matter movement. However, it's not for me to judge whether or not. It, it's okay, acceptable, or how it's being used. These are these are people in BIPOC community. You've got black and brown bodies who don't have the ability to own the same things and work in the same spaces and do the same jobs and live the same life as, as white people do right. just for the sake of not being the same color. Right. I don't have that experience. You know, I have certain microaggressions about being female. I have my number of microaggressions about being Jewish, but I've never been denied healthcare, education, or home insurance, or being able to own property or a bank account right. because of those things. There's no way for me to really understand why people are doing what they're doing. It's not my job. Right. You know, that's that, that judgment is not for me. Yeah. You know, I didn't have my community burned to the ground because my community of people was being successful. Right. The atrocities that have been unleashed on these groups of people, human beings have not changed. Yep. They're just as intense and severe as they were 200 years ago. Yeah. There's still, you know, extermination. There's still, there's now, you know, Jim Crow just evolves and evolves and evolves. Exactly. It's hard for, you know, me growing up in where I did. I grew up in Calabasas, California, my very charmed life. Yeah. Um, But having the communities that I had, my Jewish communities, um, my Chicana communities around me of my aunts and uncles and cousins. Mm Mm-hmm gave me some form of understanding. I had no idea. Right. And that learning is growing and will probably grow for the rest of my life. And the only thing I can say with certainty is that I'm committed on doing it right. Yeah. If I get it wrong, I'll fix it. If I fuck it up, I'll make amends. If there's a way for me to repair something, I'll repair it. Right. But outside of those things, it's not for me to have a say at all about how anybody else lives or how anybody else spends their money or how anybody else chooses to protest. Mm -hmm. Um, The only thing that I can do is choose it for myself. That's a beautiful statement. And I think like, and this is where like things like the cancel culture get really dicey. Um, I think that 
just like this conversation we're having right now, there's cumbersomeness, there's awkwardness. There's probably some things that I might say that I don't mean that I'll listen back and be like, Oh fuck, I can't believe I said that. And, but you know, I'm, I'm across from a human being that I know will hold that space and maybe challenge me if I do say something out of, out of, out of turn, out of color, out of whatever it is. But there's that opportunity to, to find, to revisit, like we talked about. But with our cancel culture now, there's, you could just one thing you say wrong, right? One thing you say that's mis, mistaken in a different way or misspoken about, and everybody is just now against you. You don't even have an opportunity to like say, oh, shit, like I'm, I do apologize for what I just said. Or maybe now that they're being forced into an apology they don't really mean, right? So I think like I understand how we're not accepting this anymore, right? I'm not yeah. going to take what you've just said. But to the point I just made earlier, a lot of us are, are participating in this, not realizing it, not giving any excuses. But if you're ignorant to something and then all of a sudden you've been aggressed towards that ignorance, which you don't even realize, you think that's the truth. You're not being explained in a calm way what could be the other way to look at this. All of a sudden, you're just canceled, and you don't even have an opportunity to to find way to maybe right the wrong that you've not even realized you did because you're now constantly on the defensive, mm. right? And so I think it's just dangerous that has that happened to you? Um, has that happened to you personally? I've had that. I've had misunderstandings um, with uh, family members that luckily. In after time, we've been able to revisit, but during that time where that misunderstanding was strong, there was no getting through, right? There was no revisit. Hey, let me reiterate. Let me just kind of like find a way to redo this or approach it from a different way. Um, things like that. It just, it, it, it was kind of just stopped. Right. And that I think can create some of those confirmation biases, which people that, have maybe those views that have been, you know, shunned for the views they have, but not explained as to why, or maybe an alternate view or a way, a reason to unpack why this view is there in the first place. They've just been canceled or, you know, ousted from their community of whatever it is. And now all of those ousted people find themselves because everybody does need community. Mm -hmm. And now you have a community of people that feel like, they've been wronged. And so now they're joining forces to go against those that they feel that have wronged them. But I think there's a lot of education that just, if we can find the way to hold the space to allow somebody to say something stupid and not just capitalize on that and then start berating them, but just ask those probing mm -hmm. questions, reframing, uh, yeah. right? But that also takes space. So like, that's just, you know, part, part of that is human. Like, I could, I could say that there are times where Max and I have an argument about who's going to do the dishes or who's going to book a flight and we end up, you know, having some type of, of weird argument where one of us or both of us takes out each other's stuff on each other. But that's where that, you know, compassion and empathy and accountability comes from because yeah. it may not be right then, yeah. but it may be in an hour. I think that when, I think that it's, it's cliche where it says actions are louder than words, but I think especially in that, in that instance, especially around ethnicity and culture yeah. um, and racism, I feel like you can internally feel who are the people that you know that are really doing the work and who are just saying that they're doing the work. Yeah. And I would argue to say that if you are having those conversations with people who are really doing the world work, because self-awareness can't be faked. You can't do oh, imposter no. syndrome, syndrome about self-awareness. Yeah. You can only do that so far. It only goes so far. And then it acts like a true band-aid and you see what's underneath. Mm -hmm. If you are having those interactions with, with people who are really doing the work, yes, emotions are going to fly. Yes, it may get heated, but... In time, and there may not be a timeline, they'll come back around. It won't be a an us or othered. Right. It won't be like exiled, like Game of Thrones. I mean, it it, it feels like those, it, and I and I could be wrong, and you know that I'll own that. But it feels like in those instances where you are getting that trigger to defend and prove, that's not a space you need to prove anything anyway. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a space where people just want to be right. You know, I've had friends of mine who have said, you know, oh, Jen, I don't see color, you know, in, in that whole rhetoric. 
And I vehemently disagree with that because for me, that's like, oh, you don't see anybody. You're right. Yeah. You know, um, where I feel like I see every hue of every color and accept and love and appreciate every hue of every color because who the hell am I to judge anybody but myself? Right. Um, but that is not an, and not a conversation that is going to come to some type of synergy with the people that I was talking about. Hmm. Um, they want to be right. They want to own that. That's true for them. Right. And I can say, I understand where you're coming from, but I don't agree. Right. I don't. Yeah. Um, and, and I know that, that, that conversation cannot go any further because they don't understand where I'm coming from and they don't agree. They don't want to know where I'm coming from right. and they don't agree. And that's okay. If I'm following those four agreements, as simplified as it sounds, I don't get into those messes anymore. Mm. Um, and it doesn't matter what the topic is. Right. Um, my eyes are on myself and and that's all that matters. You know, I'm going to put my, my actions where my mouth is and yeah. I'm going to make sure that my integrity is intact. And if it's not, I'm going to do something about it. And that's, I think that's, that's great. You know, there's uh, these, these conversations that we find ourselves in where we're maybe spirited, we're, you know, antagonist, protagonist, all this shit. There is a, there is a, 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 not a formula, but there's a, there's a, there's a pattern that I started to notice with, um, with somebody that doesn't, you can start to tell when people don't want to have a conversation. They just want to tell you what they think, think is fact. And, and those are, when somebody speaks to me, like they're trying to change my mind. Exactly. That's where I just, yeah. I, I, I can't anymore. Right. Exactly. Have your opinions, have your views. Beautiful. Share them. Right. I might not agree with them. That's great. Right. But just share what you, what you think is right. What you, what your knowledge is. Right. Allow me the discernment to say whether or not I adapt or adopt to what you're saying. But when somebody is constantly like using absolutes or speaking in like, you know, like says something and then like, you know, right. No, 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 no I don't. No, no nothing not. is absolute. Exactly. Nothing you know? is absolute. And so it just, you know, I try to stay away from those, you know, those, those folks that try to convince me that their point is right. You know, I just, I want to hear your information, mm -hmm. but that's up to me. Mm -hmm. And to your point you made earlier about, um, you can tell when people are doing work there, there's, I don't, I'm not bringing this into a political kind of debate or discussion right now, but I do just want to comment on that because one of the issues that I have is I've gotten older and kind of, you know, trying to sit with why I have such an issue with politics and, yeah. and politicians and, um, right, left, blah, 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 whatever, you know? <clears throat> and a lot of it is because like you have these people up there that are saying you should do this and you should do this and we should be better and we should better going home and not doing any fucking work themselves. Right. Right. They're parts of these terrible corporations that are fucking just raping the goddamn world increasing separatism, increasing segregation, all this shit, right? And then they're like, but vote for me. I'm fucking, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. And then they get in the office and they fuck all, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the, the only reason I bring that up is because we actually have two candidates now that that are actually feel like they're doing work. And not to say I, I'm for these people because I don't really know anything about them, but JFK Jr., Right. Talks a lot about empire, talks a lot about like how to better equip the human being in a psychological level <clears throat> on a spiritual level. And then you know, there's this young woman named Sarah and I can't remember her last name, but she's also running for president, um, you know, in the, the primaries right now. But both of these human beings, whether they're doing the work or not, at least talk about work to be done. Mm. Right. Mm. They're talking about like how we can better ourselves as a humanity, as an individual, not how much more money we can make and how much more bombs we can, we can have. Right. Not how many more segregations, uh, you know, t the anti woke movement in Florida, how we're going to move that throughout the entire nation, shit like that, like stuff that's like, no, get fucked. All right. These are people that are actually talking about things that, that I feel are speaking to me about how to be a better human. And, Not like and, how yeah. I think you should yeah, be a better no. human, but just being and, a better human. And time human. will tell. Yeah. Time will tell because there's, there's such a wealth of money and resources that have the ability to say all the right things. Right. And do all the right brainwashing and get you right all the way there to your voter's box. Yeah. And then you look back going, 
you didn't deliver. Yeah. And there's no, there's no guarantee. There's no contract that if you say this, you'll do this. Right. Exactly. And so it's just time. Yeah. You know, it's time and we just do the best we can. Yeah. You know, that we're human beings. We're, we're, we're going to mess up. We're, you know, the hard part with people in those positions of power is it's a lot of power. It is. And there's no way to make everybody happy. And power is intoxicating. You know, it, yes, it is. If you've never had a position of power or been put in a position of power, and it just, it, you don't realize how easy it is to take over. Right. right. I mean, even just being a fucking manager in a restaurant, there's a modicum of power that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I was raised by some very strong individuals that said, no, you're a family member. You're not their boss. You're part of their family. Mm -hmm. You treat them like that. Mm -hmm. But I've been a part of management teams where it's like, hey, guess what? We're back to the oligarchy. You do what the fuck I tell you to do. And if right. you don't, find a new team to play right. on. Right. And that's not, you know, nobody wants that either. No. Right? No. You know, so it's finding these 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 um, these opportunities. We, we're we in a place, I mean, there there is a definitely a, um, it is a privilege to mm -hmm. be able to, to get the job that makes you happy, mm -hmm. right? So many people I know are, are working at what, what we've considered like a dead end job, you know, for a person they don't want to work for, for a company they don't want to work for. Um, and it does take a special amount of privilege to say no to a job and right. to know that there's going to be another opportunity for another right. job out there. Right. You know, but you, you have that opportunity, you right? Do. And if you are recognizing as a white individual that may be straight in some kind of way, reaping the benefits of what's being, uh, what's being put out there, then you definitely have an opportunity, right? You don't have to work for Chick-fil-A right. if you don't agree with the way that they put money towards anti-LGBTQ plus, um, you know, programs. You, you cannot work at Hobby Lobby, which again, puts money towards anti LGBTQ plus, right? You can't even shop there if you want to, because mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to go to fucking Ben Franklin, right. Ben Franklin. They're throwing money at the, the pride flags. Great. Let's do that. Right. Not doing Hobby Lobby, but that is also a privilege, right? right? And so, but if you have that privilege and you have that opportunity, start, start utilizing it, right? right? Use self -awareness. it. Yeah. It's that self-awareness. Self like how can I, how can I do what I need to do to start to work through this and not forcing my views and values on somebody else. Now, granted, if somebody's standing in front of you yelling racial slurs, that's your opportunity to say something, your opportunity to not say oh, something. Yeah. That's, that's on, that's on right. you. Right. But so much of this, you know, I'm doing this. So now you should do this. Right now. You know, it's kind of yeah. like the COVID mask thing. If I'm uncomfortably wearing this fucking mask, then I don't care if it works or not. I'm going to fucking make sure everybody else wears these damn masks. Mm. Right. And that's not, that's just a, a, a statement, right? I'm not politicizing again. But, you know, it's like if I'm going to follow these rules, you have to follow these rules. Right. And if this is the culture that we're going to live in now, then everybody's got to get on board. Right. People need their time to, to, no, to unravel their own shit. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's inadvertently, um, asking for a culture of codependence. Yeah. You know, I'm asking you to expend yourself for what I want and it doesn't matter. Yeah. And we haven't like that self-awareness piece. You can't fake it. If you're doing the work, it really won't impact you the same way. Yeah. Uh, at least that's true for me, you know, I, and whatever the work is, it's, mm -hmm. it's loving yourself deeper, knowing yourself deeper, taking care of yourself deeper, um, for your highest good, however that looks like to you. But yeah. when you're in that space, that other stuff doesn't hit you the same way is when you are not doing your own work, you're harming or numbing in some way, which puts you in this position with your nervous system where you have to prove everything. Mm. It takes you out of your prefrontal cortex and puts you right in your limbic system where you're now all emotion. And so everything that's happening is now a trigger toward your insecurity mm. rather than really being able to see like, oh, this isn't mine. And it doesn't matter how or what I do. It's not going to change these people. Right. It's not going to change this. It's only going to change me. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. You know, we could be talking politics or racism or relationships or whatever. Yeah. If, if we don't have a level of self-awareness of where we know our follies, our, our falsehoods, our idiosyncrasies, our prejudices, and we're actively doing something about them to be better for ourselves and other people, we're always going to feel like we have something to prove. Right. 
we started uh, before we hit play. Um, I record. I, I mentioned this comment that that uh, was presented to me a long t- a little while ago, and, uh, and I think it was Charles Eisenstein. The aforementioned Charles Eisenstein, either him or like Zach Bush or somebody, but basically talked about how like we're we're in a time now. We're we're in one of the most peaceful times of this planet that we know of, right? As far as wars go, as far as you know, like ability to travel amongst the world, all this stuff, right? There's a there's a there's a level of like peace not overarching, not like everybody's peaceful out there, but it's not as violent as it has been. Right. Except now, for global warming, except for, global warming, right? <laughs> except for our planet's on fire. Uh, but so the, the point this person was making was like, you know, so much of setting our, our, our world up has had to be a joint effort, right? We've had to have community to do this, right. Mm-hmm. To make these nations, to make these economies that whether you believe in them or not, this is the way that we've been going. And it takes, masses to do that right right now a couple of people might control those masses we can get into that hold the conversation later but like the point this person was making was like you know people had to live in communities so they could have you know workforces to create all these things you know the the the, the buildings and the cars and the steel and all this shit right we also we we kind of had to work towards uh similar knowledge bases which with that we kind of started looking the same men short hair women long hair we have de- delineated roles in the patriarchy all this shit right we're at a place now in this in this, in this humanity that that structure again whether you agree with it or not is more or less set up now we have the ability to look at ourselves individually and say, what does Adam really think? Because right now Adam's thought what Adam has been told to think by the news outlets, by the familial outlets, by the, the, the schools I've gone to, I've been told what to think, right? Do I really think like that? Is that really something that I, that I value, right? Those, those values you've taught me, is that what I value internally the information basis that you're teaching me does that really land with me Mm. and these are those times where i have not only the ability to just pick up my phone and google any fucking thing right now again you can confirmation bias your ass off with you know these search engines but you also have the ability if you have the discernment to really kind of sift through and figure out like how this stuff lands which was one of those proponents for me to kind of do that self-work for me Mm -hmm. and so we're in that place now where we don't have to accept what the masses say because we can be like, you can hear something on TV, a friend, and be like, I don't know if that's right. And then you can look it up and be like, oh, guess what? There's countering views of what you've just said. So your absolute speech doesn't really land with me because I've got other things that might land differently. So we have the ability now to like in real time figure out how we feel about this shit. Mm -hmm. And so there's a beauty in that. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much angst right now because we have just accepted so much of this, the way our brain works, right? The default mode network, the pattern making part of our brain. It likes to put things in boxes so Mm -hmm. we don't have to use more energy. I can look at you and say, Jen, right? You're a woman. You're wearing a blouse, right? Don't have to say colors. Don't have to say whatever. Mm -hmm. Don't have to use, you know, whatever. It's just that my brain sees that. There's a fucking wall over here. There's a microphone in front of my face, right? But the more we start to say, okay, but Jen's wearing these turtle shell glasses and she's got highlights and a crocheted uh, you know, blouse on, all this stuff, we dial into that. That takes more energy and that takes us out of that default mode network, that, that trance state that we basically go into. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, when I see a human walking down the street that is um, wearing a, a dress, a spaghetti strap dress, carrying a toolbox, wearing uh, combat boots, having a beard and big burly shoulders, and then a sailor hat on. That doesn't fit in any box that I've seen before. Right. And so that's like, whoa, fucking hell, hold on, hold on. The brain's working where the brain didn't know it needed to work. I was just walking down the street, mindlessly enjoying my coffee, surfing the fucking internet, and all of a sudden this, this, this human presented themselves in front of me that I don't know what to do with. Cool. Good. Right. And you don't have to do anything. You don't. Exactly. It's just about being present. In Embrace. The yes, yeah. exactly. Embrace the presence you've just found. Yeah. It's, it's, it, there is my, my nieces and my nephews are in this generation where there's a overt level of openness, mm. um, about everything. Yeah. And it's incredible to witness. It's incredible to bear, to bear witness. 
And admittedly, there are things that I don't often understand, you know, growing up in LA in the late 70s and 80s, there's certain vernacular and vocabulary where I kind of need an upgrade because I'm like, does that really mean what it says it means? And, and what does this mean now? Right. But again, it's just being willing to be present, have empathy, compassion, and accountability. It's, it goes back to those three things. It goes back to those four agreements. If, is, if I'm working that in the world, mm-hmm. I'm going to end up inevitably being a better human to human beings and a better human to myself. And knowing that, you know, our conversations and our livelihoods span into spiritual and um, into yoga world, spirituality, physical, metaphysical, you know, frameworks, it's all going to ripple. Yeah. You know, because when we're in that place of having to prove, there's, there's, it's really, really hard to reconcile having somebody who is, is, or groups of people in an, ego mindset with a defensive outlook, having to prove something in yoga, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, it's, you know, aggressive and yoga apart from that one year when you were doing that, whatever yoga class I ended up in, oh, Bofo yoga. Uh-huh, <laughs> which, which was parody, you know, which was parody and that was hysterical. <laughs> But, but again, parody for parody's sake, yeah. when you have real live communities of people in aggression, in anger, in yoga, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a level of let's get present, let's take space, let's breathe. Yeah. And there's something that I wrote down one last piece about, you know, you had asked about creating safe spaces for people to um, have those conversations about divergent frameworks and opinions. And if you're not in that space to have that, that conversation to be able with compassion and love to be like, I'm not ready to do that right now. Mm. I'm not in that space right now to say no, because the, the bedrock of what we do as practitioners, we're not going to go work on somebody in an, in a Reiki session or an energy healing session. If we're not okay. Yeah. We're not going to go and take on something that we can't take on because it would make things worse. Yeah. It's the same thing with that dialogue. If you've had a tough day or you're not in the space where you can be present or your brain isn't clear to say, I really hear what you're saying and I want to continue this conversation. I'm not in the space. Yeah. And you're always going to know if the person you're talking to is for real because they'll always say to you, Thank you for being honest with me. Let's revisit rather than come at you mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> with, oh, you know, with, with obscenities and, and aggressions because then that's not the right person to have a conversation with. Yep. Totally. It's the idea of straw manning versus steel manning. Right. Right. So straw manning in the debate terms is when you pick apart somebody's perceived ignorant argument. But steel manning is the opposite where you want that worthy opponent, right? Even if they're not an opponent, you want them to have the strongest, make the strongest point that you can because I want to know exactly what you're saying. Right. I don't want to assume. I don't want to pick apart. I want to know how you feel and why you feel that way because that will give me the best opportunity for me to fully hear you and then respond in kind. Right. Right. But if I just hear what I want to hear... And then respond to that. You could have said, you could have, you could have rebuttaled my retort within the last five minutes of what you were saying, but I stopped listening after the first minute because right. I've tied myself to my point that I want to right. make. Right. And I don't really care what you're saying. Yeah. All I care about is what I'm going to say back. Yeah. We start that on third, in third grade. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, I think this is going to be a very, uh, uh, very long journey for myself and I right there with you, friend. Thank you so much for, for holding the space. I, you know, and this, this podcast might seem like there's no resolution, but they're never intended to be. It was an open oh, conversation yeah. just how about rolls, like yes. how, how awkward and cumbersome this feels. Um, but I think the importance of finding the, the finding people you can speak to about this, Um, knowing that you do have the ability to show up how you want to show up, not how you're forced to show up. And if you need to take some time, you didn't lose a conversation. Your ego can be at rest and you can be just fine because there's no winning for this. No. Right. The more information we share, the more space we can hold. I think the clearer this is all going to be. Agreed. Thank you. I love you. I love you. Humbled and honored, baby. Yes. Well, we'll uh, we'll keep this going. (laughs) I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for spending time with Jen and I. Uh, Again, if I offended you by what I've said, I do apologize. That's not my intention at all. I just want to share information and and be honest. 
So um, please, my information's in the in the, the show notes. So if you need to reach out to me in any way, um, I, I do welcome that. So um, obeisance and love. We'll see you next time.